Thank you all very much for coming in today. Um, this is something that we're all very passionate about and, and we enjoy. And it's great to see such a, a great crowd and, and engaged crowd. Thank you. A lot of things you could have been doing, so we appreciate it. My background, I am a neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology. And where I did my, my training, uh, the Department of Sleep Medicine was through the Department of Neurology, so I picked up sleep medicine as well. So people will ask me, am I a neurologist or do I see sleep? And I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, they'll ask me in your sleep clinic, because I'm currently doing sleep medicine full time as an outpatient. Do you see kids or do you see adults? Yes. <laughs> um, over the years, I've picked up uh, mindfulness. And also, I've, uh, over the last year, I joined the Institute for Functional Medicine. And I've learned a lot about nutrition. So people are like, so do, do you do mindfulness or nutrition? Yes. And started doing this before people started calling me holistic, and I didn't even know what holistic meant at the time. But if you're helping people sleep better, reduce stress, and eat better, you're, taking a, you're um, really improving a whole list of complaints, right? <laughs> so food is medicine. We're going to talk about energy and wellness and nutritional effects on the mitochondria and brain health. And with today... Um, some of the objectives is that we're going to understand the role of the mitochondrial for energy production. We're going to discuss the links between mitochondrial damage and neurologic damage. We're going to review ways that we can support the mitochondria through diet as well as also through phytonutrients. We're going to provide practical tips for motivation to motivate patients to engage in change. And um, another thing that we're going to do is we're going to make this world a little bit of a better place starting here in Southwest Florida. Does that sound cool? Can I get a yes? All right. So out of scope, we're not going to talk about energy medicine itself. We're not going to talk about primary mitochondrial disorders or sleep disorders. Um, mindfulness, the microbiome, and uh, FDA medicinal foods are different talks for a different day. So to give some disclosures, one thing that I always say is I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I, I receive no funding through pharmaceuticals. I am employed by Lee Memorial Health System. I am an author that has a website as well. Um, one thing I always do before I talk is I put a picture of my kids to say if I have one conflict of interest is that I am a father, I am a husband, and with every talk that I give, every book that I write, I hope this make, to, to make this world a better place for them. So having said that, Yes, I, I write books. I am a storyteller. So let's start with some story time. How about that? Once upon a time, there was a traveler. And he walked along a countryside with these big, round, shiny stones. And this town was known for the really elegant stone walls. And they had a lot of individual farms that were separated by these stone walls. And he noticed that even though there were a lot of farms, that the people in this town seemed very frail. They seemed very fatigued. They had the face of fatigue. They looked like they were complaining of, of, of headaches and just feeling down. And as he walked around, each farm had grown one particular vegetable or livestock in a bountiful manner. And, and there were these big rabbits that just thumped through the land and the biggest, uh, most colorful butterflies in that land as well. The traveler was curious as to why a place with so much food people appealed to appeared so frail and fatigued, so he started to ask around, and he goes to the carrot farmer, says, good day, sir. Your carrots are so large, and, and they have such color. Those uh, rabbits are like nearly the size of, of cats, yet you appear so fatigued and drained. And he said, well, you try living day in and day out only eating carrots and see how fatigued you'll be. He said, you only eat carrots? Why don't you take some and make yourself a chicken pot pie? <laughs> and he goes, can't do that, just can't do that. I have no chickens to make such pie. And he said, you know, the traveler was stunned. And he goes, but your neighbor in the north has plains of einkorn. And your neighbor in the south has grasslands of free-range chicken. They have theirs and I have mine. And we have stone walls to separate theirs from mine. And that's the way of life in our town. So now be gone. And the care farmer walked away. And right there, the traveler had a revelation. He says, the right thing to do is that we have to convince these people in, in the region to put their resources together. So he went, he lectured, he reasoned. Um, to him, it only made sense. One after another, they said, they have theirs, I have mine, and we have stone walls to separate theirs from mine. Um, now be gone. 
the traveler was so desperate to make things right that he shamed him. He said, look, you have obvious health problems and they have an obvious solution. One by one, they walked away. So now the day had turned night and the traveler laid his head down on a stone pillow. And as he was drifting to sleep, he saw a constellation of the Big Dipper. And as he was starting to, to, to dream, he dreamed that the Big Dipper started to swirl around the cauldron. And then there were all these big stones in there as well. And he woke up and he said, I got it. And as he sprung awoke, uh, awake, he grabbed his cooking pot. He headed towards the square. He was happy and he was banging his pot. He was laughing and singing. And this garnered the attention of the travelers and they were curious, what is this guy doing? So he pulled out the, uh, a pan and he said, mm, 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 I can't wait for breakfast. Put some water in it, put, lit a fire. And the uh, farmer started to laugh. They're like, Breakfast, you don't have anything. You might as well just eat your laundry. Aha, uh -huh. I have breakfast indeed, and it will be delicious and nutritious. And then he picked up a couple stones and he put that in the pot there. I go, stones, that's for breakfast. How is that delicious, much less nutritious? And he goes, well, you see, you live along the most fertile land, and there are minerals in this land like I haven't seen before. The colors of your produce, the colors of your crops, the 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 size of, of your livestock, this has uh, minerals that is so rich and the natural salts from the, from the stones, it has the capacity because of your land to be so great. These facts uh, about your land, they're true, are they not? And the farmers are like, well, yeah, yeah, you're right. So he took a slurp and, and then he nodded and he was happy and he goes, hmm, I wonder what could make this a little bit better. And the carrot farmer said, well, why don't you put some uh, carrots in there? And he goes, why would just adding carrots make it better? And he goes, well, if you add two things to it, it's going to taste better. Besides, you know, you said how big our, our rabbits are in this area, and you've never seen color in such carrots. He goes, I guess you're right, but I wonder what could make it even better. And the chicken farmer said, add some chickens to it, it'll make it better. The kale farmer was like, ah, if you add kale to it, it's going to be gourmet. I, the traveler said, I don't know. You have yours, they have theirs, and that's just the way of life in this town. Besides, I think that if you were to add carrot, he looked at the carrot farmer, he said, I think they would make you move. They'd make you go away. The carrot farmer was like, they can't keep me from putting carrots in there. And one after another, they can't keep me from putting the kale in there, the sweet potato or the chickens. And he goes, it looks to me like you guys have made a plan on how to make the world's greatest stone soup ever. And the farmers were nodding, and some of them were even drooling. Yes, they said throughout the valley. Well, you're motivated to make the stone soup, and I'm motivated to help as well. And when multiple people are motivated towards a common goal, I would say our chances are pretty good, don't you think? So some of the lessons from stone soup there. I like stories because there's an inner child in, in all of us that, that learn that slow and steady wins the race and, and not to cry wolf and no matter how small you feel at certain times you're just saying I think I can, I think I can. So let's take a look at some of the lessons from Stone Soup here and one of the lessons that we learned here is to mind your mitochondria. Hmm? Let me explain. So some basic biology. Our body is made up of cells and within every cell lies mitochondria and this mito mitochondria is like the powerhouse for cellular biology. It's kind of like the motor of a car. And from cardiac cells to neurons, we all have mitochondria that produce our energy. Mitochondria, they're proposed to, to originate from uh, bacteria that entered eukaryotic cells. They contain DNA that, that's their own, and they were, um, they're inherited from their mother. And they have these inner walls. Look at those inner walls in there. And its major function is for ATP synthesis to make energy. And again, that happens in those inner walls. Those inner walls um, are consisted of, of cristae, which are inner membranes that are formed of cardiolipin. And cardiolipin is a type of, of lipid. And it doesn't mean that it's just in your heart. It's just that it was first found in cardiac cells, so they called it cardiolipin. And this slide is not to give you PTSD from your biochemistry days, but to show you that, <laughs> that you know more than you think that you know. Okay. There's a number of biochemical processes that occur. And what do medications do? They change our biochemistry. Aha, uh -huh, but food does that as well. Sometimes, however, these inner walls can get damaged through oxidative stress. 
Um, and Dr. Sebastian is going to talk a little bit more about oxidative stress in his lecture as well. But when you damage those inner walls, you damage your ability to produce energy. And then lo and behold, um, disorders of, of mitochondrial structure are emerging as major mechanisms of disease, and this involves cancer, cardiovascular disease, disease endocrine disorders, and neurodegeneration as well. And by the way, I don't read from a lot of slides. Uh, when you see slides, I'm not going to read everything on there. I have them for reference, and uh, I can send them out to you if, if you want. Just, yeah. So mitochondrial dysfunction can show up as depression, headaches, fatigue, and ultimately as neurodegeneration. And this is something that got me interested in, into the subject is as, as a sleep specialist, I'll, I'll, I'll fix someone's sleep apnea or I'll diagnose narcolepsy and, and, and we'll uh, treat their sleepiness. But sometimes, despite the CPAP or despite certain treatments, we end up with this residual fatigue. And I, I just scratched my head, what is causing all of this? So going back to the mitochondrial function, let's take another look at energy production, okay? Once again, this is not to give you PTSD, but to remind you that you know more than you think that you know. We've all been through that, that biochemistry class in here. So your mitochondria, again, it's like a motor, and it, it produces energy. How does it do this? Um, we take our macronutrients, such as carbohydrates, fats, amino acids, and we get energy, right? Huzzah! Um, but it's not that simple. Just like Yes, your motor makes your car run, but guess what? You also need motor oil, you need uh, brake fluid, you, you need gasoline, you need a number of things to make the car run efficiently. And likewise, we need cofactors, vitamins, minerals, micronutrients as well. So now let's take a, a microscope and look into the walls of this mighty mitochondria. And you see that as you're trying to get through this electron transport chain, what's your goal? Your goal is energy, but to do that, you need nutrients, okay? So you need riboflavin, and sources of riboflavins uh, may include green vegetables, eggs, lean meats. So, bam, do we see how food is medicine? You need niacin. Um, sources of niacin can include starchy vegetables such as sweet potato or yellow corn. We need vitamin K that we see in dark leafy greens. We need vitamin C that we see in citrus, kiwi, cantaloupe. We need magnesium in the form of dark leafy greens again, nuts, seeds, fish, beans, whole grains, avocados. We need lipoic acid. Sources of lipoic acid may include uh, spinach, broccoli, yams, uh, tomatoes, Brussels sprouts. And Brussels sprouts um, is one of those things that if you, um, if you boil them or, or you steam them, they get kind of mushy. But what I like to do is, is, is cut them in half when they're, when they're dry, put a little olive oil on there, sprinkle some paprika, and bake them. Coño, it's good. <laughs> we also need carnitine. Um, sources of carnitine are, are red meat, lean pork, chicken breast, fish. And vegetarians may find themselves deficient in carnitine. And this is not saying anything negative about um, a, a vegan diet at all, but this is something uh, that's a reality that was brought to me by one of the teachers of this program that happens to be a vegetarian herself. We also need fatty acids, and there's a negative publicity about the connotation of, of consuming fat. However, not only is the mitochondrial membrane composed of fat, but we also need them for appropriate mitochondrial support. And such um, sources may include flax, walnuts, almonds, um, olive oil, uh, and also some in dark leafy greens as well. We also need coenzyme Q10, and some sources may include um, soybean, sesame, meats. Now the problem is, is that if your source of soybeans and meat is from the standard American diet, then we end up in a pro-inflammatory state. And this is, um, uh, this is something that, this is really dense in mic macronutrients, but it's really sparse in the micronutrients. It, it, it is an, an oasis of, of calories, but it's like a desert of nutrition there. And causes of mitochondrial damage can include calorie excess, hyperglycemia, inflammation, hypoxia, which is why you get your sleep apnea treated, um, pollutants, toxins, metals, uh, ionization. And in the story that we had, maybe there was also some uh, pollutants, um, some, some pesticides as well. Um, but our society has a lot of, of toxicities. And remember, every cell has mitochondria. 
Hence, every organ has mitochondria. Hence, mitochondrial disease can manifest with multiple organ system uh, symptoms. And the brain is uniquely vulnerable to mitochondrial damage, to oxidative damage. And there are many mechanisms by which that we could do an entire symposium one day on this itself. One of the main points is that reactive oxidation species uh, affects your mitochondria. And damaged mitochondria equals damaged brain. So how does this present neurocognitively? Ultimately as neurodegeneration. However, that neurodegeneration doesn't happen overnight. It occurs after years, if not decades, of soft signs such as depression, headaches, or fatigue. And once again, with my background, this is what got me interested in this. And you can see the, the face of exhaustion in impaired mitochondria. By the way, if you want to age really fast, all you have to do is smoke the mitochondria out of you. And this is not judgment, but this is a fact. Nor do we have time, because this is um, a nutrition talk, we don't have time to talk about herbicides and pesticides and some of the uh, bisphenols that can damage your mitochondria as well. We should be familiar with some medications, and I can provide these handouts so we can uh, review these medications. You can review these medications on your own time, but there's no wonder why sometimes we feel fatigue with whether it's metformin, statins, or valproic acid as well, because they damage the mitochondria. And again, I'll be happy to share this chart as well. So we're here to talk about nutrition and calorie excess, processed foods with high fructose corn syrup, diets high in inflammatory fats, as well as hyperglycemia. These are all toxic to your mitochondria. Obesity and diabetes combine together, something that Dr. Mark Hyman calls diabetes, impairs your, your mitochondria even further. And when they sample the, the mitochondria in these individuals, they're smaller, they have reduced contents, and they have impaired electron transport activity. Insulin resistance, in, in general, creates a perfect storm for mitochondrial dysfunction through multiple mechanisms. One of the problems that we run into is that the standard American diet is very high in refined carbohydrates and sugars, and uh, this is a typical continental breakfast. But in this nation, we might as well rename it pre-diabetes. <laughs> Many people they don't want to see this, they don't want to hear this, see no evil, hear no evil. A lot of people really just want to forget this, and many people will when they develop type 3 diabetes <laughs> or Alzheimer's. <laughs> and, and, and this is depressing. Yes, it's depressing how um, psychiatrists have identified that, uh, that uh, the standard American diet or the typical Western diet is associated with mental health problems to the point where that they uh, consider recalling it metabolic syndrome part, type 2. By the way, the notion of sugar causing damage to your brain, this only happens in adults. It is normal to start a child's day off with packaged products and stuff that has the sugar content of dessert. Maybe I'm being facetious. <laughs> Maybe even a little cantankerous. Look at that. An evidence-based review calls for all obese children to be screened for ADHD as well, as there's an association between ADHD and obesity. And we have um, quite a, an obesity and, and type 2 diabetes uh, epidemic in, in this nation, but in Southwest Florida as well. So coming back to the big picture, why are we here? Well, common types of, of neurodegeneration, such as Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment, Parkinson's. These, these are late stages, however. Early stages, you can see fatigue while you're reading, brain-based fatigue, fatigue while standing. You don't see tremors or dementia until really uh, late end stage. And damaged mitochondria equals damaged brain. Now, once you've developed a formal diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's or, or Parkinson's, many times that's about it. However, um, early symptoms such as depression or brain-based uh, fatigue, you still have a good prognosis for recovery. And in dementia, some of the earliest signs that we see are depression and apathy, no motivation, desire, or, or, or passion. And sometimes I feel like this is a lot of the patients that I see in my clinics. And you don't just develop Alzheimer's. Just using Alzheimer's as an, as an example, this happens over many different stages. You know, first forgetting to locate objects, later forgetting what you just read, 
then you start to forget recent events. Uh, and it's not until stage five that you get into mid-stage Alzheimer's disease. You know, so what stage are some of our patients? What stage are some of us in? Oh, look at that. Food is medicine. Naturally occurring phytonutrients may potentially hinder neurodegeneration and improve memory and cognition and function. Evidence-based medicine. And it's not just uh, dementia, but headaches as well. You know, one in four in a household is a migraine. And then 28 million people uh, suffer from migraines ages 12 years and up. But these are just stats. People don't relate to stats. They relate to money. And from direct and indirect costs, there's billions of dollars that is spent in, in headaches. And then headache vulnerability we see in nutritional deficiencies as well. And once again, there's a link between mitochondrial damage and migraine. Fibromyalgia is another disorder. What disorder affects more of your body than fibromyalgia? And my, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction has been shown in fibro. And that's in kids as well. We're seeing it younger and younger. And uh, I've been fortunate to work with Dr. Sebastian and some of the patients that, that we see, uh, some of the teenagers with fibromyalgia, we've been able to capture these, these things early and reverse a lot of their symptoms. Fatigue is the primary residual symptom in an appropriately SSRI-treated healthy depressed patient. So fatigue is big. And I'm not going to go through the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, but just show you a reference or references that there's a lot of evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction in chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome. And when we talk about fatigue, there's a big overlap between fatigue and depression, of which depression is the defining disorder of our time. Heart disease and cancer will kill more Americans, but depression has become the most disabling, non-fatal condition in the United States around the world. Epidemiology, one in 10 Americans report depression. Wow. You know, so some people say depression is all in your head. Well, yeah, your brain is in your head. Your brain is in your head, yeah. <laughs> and it's more biological than it is psychological. So here's your menu for depression treatment. You know, why is it that such a large number of people that are appropriately treated you know, for depression are on multiple medications, on more than one? Maybe it's because we're not getting to the root of the underlying cause, inflammation. And inflammation, oxidative stress, poor nutrition, all of these affect your mitochondria, and all of these can contribute to schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, bipolar, and even autism and ADHD. And there's an overlap in symptoms. Why do, these, do, why do these syndromes overlap so much? Maybe it's because every cell in our body has mitochondria. And then when your mitochondria are affected, you can affect multiple systems. So what can we do, okay? What is effective treatment for, for uh, improving your mitochondria? Antioxidants, glutathione, coenzyme Q10s, vitamins, minerals, cofactors, eat your vegetables. Do we see how food is medicine? Can I get a yes? So another lesson that we learned from Stone Soup, uh, Stone Soup for the Soul, is that that of nutrient, nu nutrients and phytonutrient diversity. A little bit of a lot of different colors is better than a lot of just one particular thing. Now another question that I've been asked from time to time is, is it important to eat organic? Well, understand that if it's not organic, it may contain pesticides or herbicides, which we showed the evidence how that can affect your mitochondria. But there's another thing is that when, when plants are stressed, they produce more phytonutrients. And the phytonutrients that give the blueberries the color or the onion its, its, its flavor um, to an insect has a pungent taste to it. So if there is no stress, they're not producing. You, you, you have the, or, uh, the pesticides and the herbicides. They're not in a stressed in environment. They're not producing as much phytonutrients. Um, I'm not suggesting that you yell at your, at your farm to stress it, <laughs> but whenever you can buy local and, and whenever it's reasonable to buy organic, yes, it is better. And Dr. Sebastian will talk a little bit more about this as well. So other fiber, other phytochemicals that support mitochondrial function, turmeric is anti-inflammatory, sulforaphane is in cruciferous vegetables and also reduces cancer risk. All these phytonutrients in your fruits and vegetables and polyphenols can help prevent neurodegenerative disease. And fats as well. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids make up 
the mitochondrial membrane and also regenerate the membrane and assist with the fluidity. With the fluidity. So what are you going to do now, okay? Are you going to tell your patients to diet and exercise now that you know this? Are you going to go tell your patients to eat your fruits and vegetables? Are you going to tell them to, to, to control their diabetes by preventing it rather than forming mitochondrial damage? It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. All right, so that's what we had there on the video. Now, and if you remember, that's what the traveler tried to do. Back to lessons from the stone soup. You know, how did this work out for him? So it's important to remember also that slow and steady wins the race, my friends. So another lesson from stone soup is that motivation for change has to come from within, okay? We know that food is calories. We also know, learning today, that food is medicine. But, you know, let's not forget, food is connection. Food is culture, and we have to understand that when we're asking people to change their lives, you're asking them to change their lives. And then um, you're asking them to read, you're asking them to cook, and telling someone to change their, their lifestyle when they don't know how to cook, you know, this is like s s saying go read a self-help book when you don't know how to read. We need to work together as a community to, to create the motivation that people want to, to, to change. So in the traditional approach, we think that they don't see, so we provide them with insight, believe they'll change. Uh, we think they don't know, so we provide them with knowledge. We think they don't care, so we'll guilt or shame them. However, the farmer in this story used something called motivational interviewing. And motivational interviewing is a collaborative, person-centered form of guiding to elicit, elicit and strengthen motivation for change. It's a clinical method of guiding patients, and it's not like cognitive behavioral therapy, but it is a, a, a different form. So motivational interviewing is about helping people talk themselves into change. It's about autonomy, not authority. It's about collaboration, not confrontation. Evocation, not education. And finding what their interests are, not your own Im imperatives. And some general uh, rules of this is resisting the writing reflex, which that's what they were doing with the nail there, and the farmer was, was doing as well. Understand your, po your patient's motivation. Listen to your patient and empower your patient as well. So just a couple examples of, of how I do this, um, or how anyone can do this. Uh, a patient comes back for follow-up and they've had some weight loss. And I'll mention, you know, the average American gains two pounds per year. However, since our last visit, you've lost uh, a pound. What positive steps have you done that has resulted in this? So I, I'm engaging, asking them what their motivation. Even if they said that they didn't do anything. Okay, at that point, I've just opened the door for weight discussion. Sometimes I have to do the opposite, where I say, hey, the average American gains two pounds per year. In our three-month three follow-up, you've gained uh, three pounds there. So ha have them kind of think about it and, and bring, uh, bring some up. And a kid, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll hear, oh, but, you know, yeah, we have fruits and vegetables in the house, but I'm finding wrappers here, and, and he'll only eat this or whatever. So I'll say, okay. So let me reflect on what you're hearing. Your kid eats what's in the house. And then they'll say, well, you know, maybe I guess I, 
I don't have to keep this, or I can keep something else instead. They're bringing it up. I had another patient come up to me and said, the pressure of CPAP that you put me on is too high. Okay, I show them a, a before and after of an airway of, of weight loss. And I also mentioned that if someone has a neck circumference of uh, male of 17 inches or more, that they're at increased risk of sleep apnea. Mentioned that they have one of 18 inches. And they're, they're like, hmm, maybe I could lose some weight and I won't need as much CPAP. You have good insight. <laughs> you sound motivated. If a patient states that diabetes or heart disease or dementia runs in their family, ask, tell me. What was your parents' favorite food? How did they eat? Okay, you're taking them out of it, but now you're in, in, engaging the conversation. So this is something that we can have an entire day lecture on. What I'd like to do is, is say that motivational interviewing has been shown to be effective for anything that it's ever been studied in, um, including weight management. And here's uh, two books that are very helpful for that. So I listen to their concerns. I listen to their apprehensions. I provide them with options. I let them say, you know, if, if, uh, if I could only lose some weight or, or if I eat healthier, I, you know, I bet I would feel better. Yeah, I think you're right. Again, you have good insight. And then I point out, sounds like you're motivated to make a change. And then later I'll ask, can I give some advice? And you ask. You ask if you can give some advice. And one of the first things that I start off with is saying, before we take something away from your diet, let's add something, okay? Let's add some colors to your diet and add some, some healthy fats as well. So if you're going to have uh, an apple, you've added color, now have a palm full of, of almonds and you're decreasing the, the glycemic index. Uh, a lot of people like the juice and, and that's great, but look at the sugar content at some of this. Let's add some flax seeds or something that's going to also lower the glycemic index and balance the sugars. Now after I've seen them a, a couple times or they're ready to make change, then at that point I bring up the concept of the mitochondrial food plan. The mitochondrial food plan is one of several therapeutic food plans through the Institute for Functional Medicine. And this one is one that supports your mitochondria. It is very low glycemic and very high in, phyto, in the phytonutrient spectrum. Um, interesting, when I first gave this talk, right before I did this, I was on the phone with a researcher from the NIH and she was saying that this is at, you know, I, I gave her a, co a copy of the Mito food plan, and it was like, oh my God, this is really exactly what we're doing in some of our kids with mitochondrial disorders. And then recently I was on the phone uh, with Institute for Functional Medicine as well as Scott Cashman as we're going to be trying to, to study this over here. And the creators of the Mito food plan, they said the other thing that they've noticed is that a lot of people have been losing weight on it. So they first instituted it for protection of, of brain disease, but they've been finding that people's vitality has been uh, pretty good as well. So the Mito food plan was debel developed based on literature review and also input into uh, some of the top uh, nutritionists and, and physicians within, um, within healthcare. And it is um, the, the standard distribution of, of, of a regular diet many times is 45% is, uh, carbohydrates, 25% protein, and 30% fat. This is, again, very low glycemic, so it's lower on the carbohydrate. And your calories are going to be 20% from carbohydrates, mostly in the form of uh, fruits and vegetables, mostly in, in the vegetables, preferred non-starchy vegetables above the ground as opposed to the more starchy ones uh, below. The other 20% is from protein, so it's not um, uh, a protein overload. People think paleo diet and they think, okay, you eat half a cow and you put bacon on it. No, that's, that's, not, <laughs> that's not a paleo diet and then the rest of your calories are coming from fats, well, the, you know, a lot of the recommendations are to have six to eight servings of fruits and vegetables. When you're doing the Mito food plan, you're really kind of targeting more eight to 12 servings of fruits and vegetables. So where are you gonna get your calories from? Again, they come from healthy fats that we'll discuss. So I'd like to invite everyone to go to YouTube either tonight or after this lecture and, and go ahead and YouTube, Google Terry Walls and TED Talk, and you're gonna see a powerful uh, lecture, a powerful story about um, a physician whose life was derailed by a refractory multiple sclerosis. And she was in a wheelchair and she went from a wheelchair to walking and doing her Taekwondo again through change in diet alone. And she was one of the contributors to this food plan and she has this quote that I think is great. Our fixation on the perfect ratio of macronutrients is misguided. 
Instead, we should be fixed on, on how to maximize the vitamins, minerals, antioxidant status from foods. So some things within the mito food plan, uh, some of the things we see almonds, and that has uh, glutathione in there, which is a very important antioxidant. Uh, it is a monosaturated fat and also has some vitamin E. Uh, we do have avocados as well. Again, once again, this has glutathione and some other uh, goodies. Um, we see buffalo or beef that is grass fed. And I was listening to an audio book and Andrew Well was really Andrew Weil was talking about the difference between grass-fed and regular meats. And I know that we have a, a lot of information on, uh, on meats in the diet with the China study, but there's a difference in different kinds of meats as well. So our, our, we've had electricity for, you know, we've had the light bulb for just over 100 years. We've had packaged foods for less, right? But humanity started to develop 66 million years after the, the dinosaurs were its in, uh, extinct. So we developed millions of years with certain genetics, and in that genetics, they consumed a ratio of one to one omega-3 to omega-6. The omega-3 um, is what we're promoting. The omega-6 is more inflammatory. But the standard American diet has a 12 to 1 ratio of omega-6 uh, over the omega-1. So it's very high in inflammatory. So that's why if, if you have meat, it's recommended that it's lean meat. Or Grass-fed in particular is, is what we're recommending there. Um, blueberries is rich in phytonutrients that improve blood flow to the brain and protect neurons from free radical damage. Broccoli um, activates NERF2 and decreases inflammation. And this is something that um, I do many times is if I go to a restaurant or a sports pub, instead of getting french fries, I ask for some steamed broccoli. Very easy to do. I ask for... Um, uh, a little bit of olive oil, which we'll talk about, and then uh, lemon on there. Coconut oil. Um, coconut oil has received a lot of bad press because it's a saturated fat, but not all fats are equal. And it is a medium chain fat, and coconut oil supports your mitochondria, which is energy, um, which is the energy generator of, of our cell, including our, our brain. And coconut oil has been found to benefit from ADHD to uh, Alzheimer's as well, and here's some references. Green tea, EGCG appears to have powerful antioxidant uh, effects against free radicals. Uh, NERF2 um, is something, again, that we discussed decreases inflammation, decreases inflammation and has some antioxidant uh, properties as well. Olive oil, I, I mentioned uh, a way that you can use that, and that's uh, anti-inflammatory and high in polyphenols as well. Pomegranate, high, very high in antioxidants. It's anti-inflammatory, uh, high fiber, and it, it's actually something that, that you can do easy. Um, I recommend that you have the pomegranate itself, but uh, another kind of supplementation is something that you can do. Sometimes if I'm watching a, a game or I want a cold one, I'll get some club soda. I'll fill the cup up 75% and then I'll, of club soda, and then I'll just put a splash of pomegranate juice, and it's a way to increase the the phytonutrients there. And this is a good alternative to, for kids as well. We, we use this in our house and we call it soda juice. That way they don't you know, feel left out and they can have that. Uh, salmon, wild Alaskan is preferred if it's a uh, wild caught, uh, high in omega-3, a good source of CoQ10 as well as also glutathione. And this is um, kind of like an emergency meal that I have is that I keep some cans of, of wild caught salmon. And if I forgot my lunch or I'm um, you got have something to do, sometimes I can uh, go to a grocery store on my way and get a, a bag of arugula or a watercress and mix it with the, with the salmon, and that's a great you know, emergency meal. Seaweed is high in, in minerals for our mitochondria, um, antioxidant properties, and has selenium and magnesium ten times higher than that of veggies. Um, you can buy this sometimes. Some of the ones that they have in the regular grocery store could be high sodium. But another alternative is you can go to some of the Asian markets and they have the dried uh, seaweed little things and we, you can munch on those instead of chips. Spinach is also likewise high in antioxidants that help with improving memories as well as carotenoids. Um, the flavonoids are anti-inflammatory and as we mentioned, antioxidant. And this is funny because there was this one day that I was trying to get my son to eat a spinach. And I go, young man, you got to eat your spinach. You know, that way you can be like Popeye. And he looked at me and he goes, who? <laughs> so 
So I went onto YouTube and I showed him some, some clips of Popeye and that was fun. And then I go, you see what happens when you eat your spinach? He goes, yeah, you fight. <laughs> that was parent fail number too many to count. <laughs> So the mitochondrial food plan um, is something that, that I can provide with patients as, as I've established rapport, as we've made some changes, and it comes with a comprehensive guide. It comes with a, a weekly planner with some recipes, with shopping lists. But again, it's one of several food plans through the Institute for Functional Medicine. And if, you ha if you're a member, you have access to the mito food plan, the cardiometabolic food plan, the core food plan, their elimination diet, and all of these have vegan options as well. I would like to let you all know that if you go to the Institute for Functional Medicine website, you can take a free webinar and get CME for it on functional nutrition. And you will learn more about nutrition than you did in med school because personally, I didn't learn anything about nutrition in med school. So where are my references? Bam, evidence-based medicine on focus on whole foods. Evidence-based medicine on the balance of quality fats. Evidence-based medicine on phytonutrient diversity. So it's all there. And also exercises increases the number of the total mitochondria. And this is uh, another thing that the lady from NIH that's a researcher was stating is that when you include exercise, you're turning over the bad mitochondria, you're uh, increasing some of the good mitochondria. And maybe that's another lesson from Stone Soup. The guy was walking around and he was getting some exercise. And exercise improves your brain as well. The more that you exercise, in particular, the intensity, you're increasing BDNF. What is that? It's growth hormone for your brain. Now, in the ketogenic diet, the, the mito food plan is, is uh, mildly ketogenic. It, it doesn't actually go into the ketosis, but it's very low glycemic. But there is a ketogenic option. And conventional wisdom has been that mitochondrial prefer carbohydrates in the form of glucose as their primary energy. However, fatty acids and ketones and amino acids can be utilized by the mitochondria as well. And the ketogenic diet has been shown to reduce inflammation, enhance mitochondrial biogenesis, um, enhance ATP production, reduce reactive oxidative species, reduce apoptosis, increase insulin sensitivity, as well as leptin sensitivity. Some disorders that have been treated with a mitochondrial, uh, excuse me, with the ketogenic diet are a lot of different neurologic disorders. I've also seen some, some evidence that it's been used in narcolepsy, something that I see a lot of, as well as also there's been some evidence that it's been helpful for depression as well. And diet and ADHD, this could be an entire different topic for a different day. Um, but what I'll say is that there's a lot of evidence on there. You go through the NIH page, and, and you'll see that ADHD associate is associated with a Western-style diet. So there's a lot, a lot of different things that, that we can do. Everything that, that we've talked about today can also help out. So um, as we remember, um, as we in the future get our food is medicine pens, let's remember quotes from uh, the father of medicine, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And I'm very proud to be part of this tradition of doctors teaching doctors that, that dates back older than the, than the brotherhood, okay? So today we learned about nutrition. But let's not forget, he said something else too. Sleep and watchfulness, both of them, when immoderate, constitute disease. What does that say? Another lesson from Stone Soup is that sleep is important. Yes, the sleep guy says that. And if you remember, you go back to the story of Stone Soup, but he didn't get the, the answer of what to do until he went to sleep and then he had his dream. Well, pretty similarly, Einstein was stuck on the theory of relativity and then the answer came to him in a dream. Isn't that a daisy? Sleep equals MC squared. <laughs> <laughs> and I personally really never had a problem that, that I wasn't able to eventually overcome without either a runner's high or a good night's sleep. Um, earlier in the year, uh, when we had the national speakers, I, I talked on sleep and wellness, and they recorded this, and they put it on, on YouTube uh, through the Lee Memorial Health site. And I encourage all y'all to go through this. You're going to learn more about sleep than you've learned throughout med school, and that's not me just saying it, but that's what different doctors, nurses, and a lot of people have told me as well. One last lesson from uh, Stone Soup, okay? Put your resources together. When we work together as, as doctors, as nurses, as nutritionists, as wellness coaches, when we work together and we're all 
talking about nutrition, we can make an impact and create motivation for change. So this is something that Dr. Mark Hyman commonly quotes, an old African proverb, if you want to travel swiftly, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. If anybody wants any of the information on the mitochondrial food plan or a copy of the slides, um, I'd be happy to send it to you. Also, information on, on phytonutrient spectrum uh, itself. Send it, give, it, give me a, a non-work email because the, the, the load is very high and it can't, can't transfer it through the Lee Memorial email. And the last thing that I want to say is remember that when we encourage others to encourage others, we make this world a better place. Thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.